right, we are here. Um, I am Sean Smith from Cal State Long Beach, uh, along with Jeff Lawler um, from Cal State Long Beach. We didn't introduce ourselves the last time we did this, so I'm, a, I'm doing that. Um, we are the directors of the CSULB Center for the History of Video Games and Critical Play, and this is our series, Talking the NES, where we're looking specifically at history-based games uh, that were released for the NES um, in the middle to late part of the 1980s. Today we are looking at the 19 uh, at the 1984 Capcom release 1942. With the NES being released uh, 1985, there's a, a a batch of waves uh, games released in. Uh, 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 middle of that year, um, towards the end of that year, then 1986, there's a bunch of games released, uh, maybe six or seven, I didn't write them down, released. And then in kind of October, November, December, there's another four or five games released or so. So this is uh, within the first 20, 24 games. It's still uh, early. Um, it's obviously a port from the 1942 arcade game, but here we have it in the, the NES, a popular game, so a, probably a perceived popular port yeah, to the um, NES. Yeah, I mean, for me, this was definitely one that was in my early collection um, and a game that I kind of consistently go back to. Uh, we were talking before we started, and um, I was saying that you know, when anytime I've done any kind of retro game machine, be it a MAME emulator or an NES emulator, um, or even kind of playing one of the first kind of games I, I, I pop in just to get the feeling back is 1942. Um, there's something satisfying about this game um, and it scratches that itch of, I think you said it later, in, um, in, that, in that kind of Galaga frame, in that mm -hmm. top-down scroller um, that just, yeah, I don't know. There's something about the way that this functions um, that I respond to a little bit better than the side-scrolling shooters. Um, mm. I don't know if, right, I don't know what it is about that. It, um, it definitely, um, yeah, as I said, for me, it felt particularly when you get the waves of the, the circling yeah, there's uh, planes it. coming in. It yeah. has that, that Galaga-esque feel to it in that, in that top top uh top down scroller um so yeah there's a familiarity to that and yeah. it fit within the genre of, of games coming out like that yeah this um, is one where you could i mean in the arcade you could actually put a quarter in and mm -hmm. expect to play for at least a little while yeah but, um it didn't completely destroy <laughs> it, like last <laughs> couple of weeks ago it was no commando no. right oh, um, man. yeah you could learn the basics and basic evasive maneuvers yeah plus you have the roles to evade you only get three of them but they're enough where you can um if you become somewhat proficient you know you're going to play five six seven eight nine ten levels right right um even if you don't get through all this the 33 stages in this so it's a long process right. to get to the end and i um, can say i have never finished this um <laughs> in the time that I, even at the time that I had it um, on the NES, I, I never finished it. Um, the only, yeah. Um, and, I, and it's one of those things. That we, I don't think we ever really considered the finishing of games to be all that important. Right? Um, in a game like this where, yeah, I mean, all you got to do was flex, right? If you finished it. Um, and I'm not sure that I, was the biggest. I only had playground one flex, particular so. game I ever wanted to finish, but that was pitfall on a television and that's a totally different does scene that, but does that fin oh i guess it does finish yeah the maze does and right yeah you collect and you, all the we, treasures within a certain time frame and you yeah and you yeah. you got a certain score then you sent in your picture and you got a, a patch which patch I, I still Activision. have somewhere <laughs> <laughs> for yeah. harry pitfall but yeah this this definitely was um yeah it's it's a fun game yeah. um it's it's 1942 top down right. scroller uh, I have a lot of people talk about it um you know in 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 the period uh that as an NES game whether it's um 
a realistic port, it seems fairly. I mean, yeah. for early NES game in particular. Yeah, and I um, digging through the old game magazines. Um, I don't think either of us could find a review for this. Um, so if somebody knows where of one, that would be helpful. But um, so it, not an arcade review, right? This yeah, is the, I've seen the NES. arcade reviews, but I haven't yeah. seen the NES reviews um, right. from it. And I mean, it predates the magazine, so um, right, Nintendo Power. So that, that, that could be part of it. Um, it is in the early game frames and before some of that game's media actually kind of really took off. Yeah. Um, but again, we're also relying pretty heavily on um, Internet Archive for that media. And um, I'm assuming somewhere there's some... Somebody had to have looked at this at some point. but Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, maybe I don't even know if that's important, but um, right. Yeah, the last us, one, it it's, was the weird. The weird part was like Commando was, that came out before this was really well, like covered in the press. There is all kinds of small blurbs about it, and I found the companion game to this or the sequel to this, the 1943. I found reviews of that. Um, so this just kind of sits in this. It's I think popular with people, but it just never kind of it never got that um attention that I some of the other games if, did if commando being part of the early release with the release of nes yeah um that and it, it and somewhat a, a new sort of framework it's also a port we talked about that right and then um later games because of the proliferation of other magazines right picking up and nes becoming popular and this maybe falls in a weird zone yeah of of a lack of publicity and um uh content for the console i don't know yeah i was looking to see what it came out with um yeah i have that somewhere <laughs> uh, it, it, it didn't come out at the same date as any but it was within a uh, a couple of months of some other games and that that's an excellent question right and just to see uh, if it got overlooked because something else I, more I think interesting I... came out right uh we haven't mentioned it this is uh, a world war ii game an obvious world war ii game uh, <laughs> um, yeah right there's there's no ambigu ambiguity um around what you who you are and what you're doing in this um according to everything we kind of looked at um and I think it's in the instruction manual as well. Um, you are a pilot of a Lockheed P-38 Lightning. And all of the planes in it, in the game, are are Representative from... of some form of World War II aircraft, whether yeah. it's Japanese aircraft or American aircraft, right? Right. Although yeah. no, there would be no other American aircraft. Um, right. Not, it, <laughs> Not in yeah. this. So this, so this is the one you get. Yes, the one you get. And mm -hmm. it's a shame because if I have any right proclivity towards naval air power during World War II, it would have been for the Corse Air. Um, that's oh. the, that's the one I made the models of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, another um, that, another in the fleet that would have been taking off from the decks of aircraft right. carriers, but yeah. yes, but had cool wing sweep and the fold up wings so that they could yes, store it. Yes, I remember it. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. So so this this brings really for us, right? Uh, I mean, we're interested in somewhat of the game and its popularity and release, but the game brings up the obvious point it is a World War II game. And for us, um, I'm talking about it and then digging a little bit, um, this is a World War II game where you coming out of Japan, coming out of Nintendo, coming out of Capcom, mm -hmm. um, where you take on the role of an American right. pilot, piloting an American plane, destroying the Japanese <laughs> fleet. Right. Um, the goal and so that is, brought, right, the goal is to reach Tokyo in this, right? Um, um, the final yeah. stage, uh, boss stage is kind of unclear. Right. You go through Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Saipan, uh and a few marshall islands midway a few other right. places so i don't maybe you get to 
Tokyo, yeah, I think like that, you said, I, I never the goal got is that. Tokyo, but um, um, yeah. So ultimately, defeat Japan, def- mm-hmm. defeat the military. So, and this game a- a- appears to have been also released on the Famicom yeah. in Japan, um, uh, in in the same format, ostensibly, right. um, with some you know language. Well, and presumably uh, the arcade cabinets were in Japanese arcades yeah. as well. So right, um, right, and this is for or popular, right, and and so this we we are in by no stretch of the imagination history historians of Japan, um, no. <laughs> and mm-hmm. for me, and I and I think I speak for Jeff on the, in in this too. Um, Right, we we speak here only out of uh, out of the curiosity of the th- of or the questions that could be asked from mm-hmm. a game like this, right? Um, yeah, and we've done some some bit of research. We did scour um, journal articles mm-hmm. um, and um, particularly some monographs on uh, Japanese culture technology consumption um, as much as we we had time to um, and asking those questions yeah so all of all of our sort of come to moments uh, are, are are based on how do we assess uh, a game like this mm-hmm. um, positioning itself as you know you taking the role of attacking Japan because it's very hard to imagine um, let's say uh, an American company coming up with a game, particularly at this time, where you're attacking the United right. States yeah, and attempting no, to defeat it, counterfactual. Otherwise, I mean, even in Commando, we talked about a few weeks ago, you are the commando going out and right. s- saving um, or protecting in some tangential tertiary way uh, American ideals. Right. And in this, it's just completely, while you don't necessarily destroy Japan per se, you're destroying the the mechanisms, the mechanisms the of war, yeah, the uh, technology, war. Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so I suppose in two ways, and I think we can both speak to this a little bit is what, what we discern. And, and these are again, questions more than anything or right. that the, 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 the post world war two era in Japan is, um, they have to demilitarize, right. uh, right. They, they can't even, uh, make toys, uh, that, from that are Japanese replicas of Japanese military, right. uh, Japanese military art and propaganda is confiscated, right? So everything about the military and nationalism is kind of subdued uh, by the allies and American forces. And so we, we're questions about what role that plays and how Japan was saw itself, itself right. and could portray itself. Right. And, and the legacy of that, because from 45 to 86, you know, these are this is 40 years. So this could right. be transformative. And then the other point is deals with technology and consumption, both the production of technology and Japan becoming technologically, technologically savvy, power- sophisticated and powerful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In the 60s and 70s right. into the 80s with a variety of different right. companies um, uh, strengthening the role in, in selling right. these things. Um, and the consumption of, of Japanese culture and technology in As the United it grows, States. Yeah, in the United States, um, which is also, I mean, this is one of those periods, again, from the U.S. perspective, where it's rife with strange contradictions, right? Um, we've got Nintendo, um, ostensibly Nintendo of America, and I suppose that's how they soften that edge, right? Our consumption of these devices were coming Art. from American branches of these mm-hmm. traditionally Japanese game or gaming companies, which, right? Which so, are still Japanese, Japanese right? Yeah. And, <laughs> right. Because, but yeah. <laughs> but even in the press, right? It's Nintendo of America presents. Yeah. It was yeah. never right, and this was at a time, this mid '80s, right, when um, Japan's preeminence in technology, it's growing wealth from the re, from its post-war experience and America's kind of decline in the late 70s and early 80s, especially in the auto industry and other places like that, put this kind of pressure on or that created this kind of even, I think, a kind of xenophobic response to 
Japan and Japanese consumer goods and Japanese and Japanese people in 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 Amer in, in the United States themselves, right? And so we get silly movies um, like Gung Ho, uh, <laughs> right? The American right where the auto industry is dealing with a Japanese takeover, um, and oh, yeah. Right. It was a um, Michael Keaton. I think. It's Michael yeah, Keaton. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you get this right. There's a, a, at the same time, though, that, you know, Nintendo and and later Sega are going to become and Namco and Capcom and Taito and all of these Japanese companies that are making video games, um, both arcade games and consoles are going to become really these behemoths um, and lead the way in in the video games industry. Um, so, there, yeah, I, and I don't know, this is, again, it's one of those moments where games kind of offer up this lens into um, a variety of cultural transformations that are have, happening um, in, in, in the United States on the consu consumer level um, in Japan on kind of their reckoning with their own post-war histories. Yeah, and and it, it, you do the you know the 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 growth of you know Japanese technology and 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 through the '60s and '70s into the '80s um, is is in particular related to the the post-war experience, right? right? And uh, you know whether it's the the strengthening role in America of companies like Panasonic or Mitsubishi or um, what have you, um, they 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 see America as a market, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and maybe this benefited, and I don't know enough about this, but it seems natural by their demilitarization, right? The, a lot of their uh, they, as, as some articles mentioned, there was never any sort of uh, because it's prescribed, there's never any military, industrial, military, academic right. uh, alliance. It it can't exist, and right. and so everything, nothing stems from that. Like when we talk about commando, there is this connection to sort of Cold War, you know, the technology mm -hmm. or even early computing in the United States. And here, there's a di divorce from that because nationalism has been squashed out of World War II, even though it may still. Exist exists right, right. And it, socially right. but it it the the separation that is is more of a economic consumption and consumerism that can uh um develop these technologies and export these technologies to the growing and largest consumer market in the world the united states <laughs> right <laughs> um where we're buying up electronics which kind of feeds into potentially I, I had totally forgotten about Gung Ho and Michael right. Keaton, but I can, <laughs> I can think back to it very well, um, to maybe some of those fears, right? right. And these are generally xenophobic fears that many of the United States often yeah. goes to when it sees itself being usurped in some way, whether technologically or, or, or militarily right. or is, what have you. This is the period where um, Sony was, the, the motion picture wing of sony was also vying to buy american film companies mm -hmm. um right this was when the hawaii was being uh developed or was being um at least the perception of it was that it was being bought up by japanese businessmen right and a lot of the same xenoph xenophobic fears that we witness um you know over kind of the, the rising tide of, of Chinese businessmen in, in both the West Coast of Canada and the United States. You see that, I think, with the Japanese. Um, and, that, and that xenophobia always goes back to World War II. Video footage from a playthrough uh, by a YouTuber called Nintendo Complete. I just want to give them full credit uh, for this footage. This isn't our footage, so I left the watermark on. Um, so uh, let we me. We played, but we did not. Yeah, we play played, but we didn't record it, stages. and we didn't. Yeah, we didn't play all thirty odd stages. So um, this is here. Um, this is from an early stage. This is in the 
uh, last of 30 stage, I believe. Um, so, yeah. I mean, and so, yeah, the game, here you are, you're shooting down. Um, hmm. it, for me, in some ways, from some of the material I, I read, is uh, w one way to do this is while they are Japanese planes, um, everything is is faceless right right so you could almost in some ways forget it um as i had pulled one quote from one um uh uh japanese artist and he was talking about anime you know as anime develops uh, or manga develops in the 50s 60s really you know mm -hmm. um, but doesn't really come over to the united states in any large form until later there's some exceptions to this with things like Everybody remembers Speed Racer right. in the 70s. Um, um, he says that uh, a lot of uh, anime, to quote him, uh, I'll mispronounce his name, Koichi Awabuchi stated, quote, anime, like much of Japanese popular culture, is culturally odorless. Um, I found that interesting mm. in terms of thinking of uh, a lot of the imagery uh, in anime and other forms uh was um not very complete japanese right it could be seen as something else a more westernized style and in this game right there's no except for the machines the machines right. are just merely the objects of japanese warfare just like you're the plane and so while you're defeating the japanese um uh, they are faceless in this sense. Right. right? It's, it's is, technology versus technology. There aren't people involved. Which which right. could be seen as a, another issue of dehumanization of war. But right. in here, it, it seems maybe to convert into, yes, um, it's not that big of a, as big of a deal, right? Um, because you are defeating the the machinery. And as, as the military is dead anyway, hmm. um, Right. right. It, it, it's kind of a moot point. Like, what does that matter? Um, now that the, the defeat maybe has been accepted, I don't know much enough about Japanese history to speak right. to that. Yeah. Um, um, let me, I'll play a little bit more. Um, so I'm pushing this forward to, uh, you see, we're flying over uh, some landmass in this instance. Um, yeah, you. Uh, this game in versus versus 1943, which comes out uh, what a year and a half later or so. Um, 1943, um, a smoother game, but you're doing much of the same thing. But you're, it's the battle of midway specifically, mm -hmm. and I, I I found interesting you, the the boss battles with the battleship uh, Yam, Yamato. If I'm pronouncing that correctly, I apologize. Um, um, and the Yamato was a real Japanese battleship, but it also represented an idea for the Japanese people. So in some ways, it I don't know what significance can be read into that because you have to destroy it, but it is the boss, right? right. And it is at the last stage, and it's very difficult to to do. Um, all the battleships right. in Midway are, are fairly difficult to defeat. Um, and... Um, in some ways, it could be seen um, that, that the battleship also represents potentially the sacrifices of, of Japanese. Because uh, the Yamato was uh, purposefully sent, uh, I believe, to Okinawa to defend it, but to defend it to its death. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in some ways, it's a fulfillment exercise in an odd way. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I, I'm right. Just thinking through that point right now, I right. haven't thought about that as much. But um, if we're to read into any of this that much, it could be just that these were artifacts and some of these things were employed so that the Japanese could also understand the space, right? For, for Americans, if I'm playing it as a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old, whatever, um, I'm just defeating. Yeah, no, the, signif the, yeah, the significance of... of of this game is is much different from a kind of u.s consumer perspective right this is yeah. just a reaffirmation of the greatest generation and yeah. the good fight um yeah. right this is a war this is 
an uncontroversial right game in which you can sit and know that you are on the right side of history as you're playing this game right this is a pretty typical reinforcement of american ideal uh, of american um, idealism of world war ii um, and of our role in it right um and this again it, it, playing with the technological side of things in this instance right it's again it's it's it, it's not a dehumanized war right but it is it's a, it's it, it's this growing sense of of war as technical um mm. as war as um fought machinery. by machine yeah the, but not only just mach- the machine of war but 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 fought by machinery right these are kind of the precursor to those to to the drone strikes in in later games and in later warfare where i think in the 1980s and going into the 1990s um there was this kind of kind of this this faith in 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 technology as a means by which we were going to humanize war by dehumanizing the act of war right Mm. um right and i I, and i these are ideas that i mean this the kind of what the whole point of this little series is is to have us kind of think through some things um, <laughs> yeah, out loud as we're talking about right <laughs> out loud with an audience um, mm-hmm. and we could be like completely full of shit um, but I think some of this makes sense <laughs> um, yeah yeah I, that's, it, yeah. It, it helps us think through this but it hopefully it also garners questions that right. people might have think or, or have people think about also uh, because for us as we mentioned in all our videos whether it's historians react or this new series right we we want to garner questions and think about these these objects as serious things um and intent or not you know consumption of the goods also matters and right um just situating in them in the cultural context gives us a sense of the era and and uh what play meant um how how these things kind of connected mm-hmm. um yeah so 1942 is it seems so simple when we started right yeah but there's these uh <laughs> no and i i, I honestly <laughs> didn't think there'd be much to say uh, about a game like this right when at first glance it literally is um and especially from an american consum- consumer perspective it is the same kind of world war ii I don't want to call it propaganda, but the, the same way that we've approached World War II as a nation, um, as as kind of all pop culture, right? And as part of that generation that grew up really with World War II as our pop culture war, right? For mm. for the 1980s, until we get to that that reckoning moment that we talked about last last time we did this with Vietnam, most of what we grew up with as pop culture war pop culture was world war ii because it was easy yeah and there's there's nothing controversial about it right you could have right uh what was that robert mitchum series on tv that jan michael vincent and well everybody was on those um oh not robert ludlum's oh history of world war ii yeah Um, right yeah um, right. And there's a, and the models that we built, if you were building models <laughs> and not painting D&D characters. I was just going to say it was um, one or the other. <laughs> right. <laughs> All of it was primarily military technology from World War Two. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I think, you know, for for an American consumer, um, this was an easy get um, that that was completely non-controversial and allowed us to have fun right um without ever having to really seriously think about the narrative implications um although i don't think any 12 year old really thinks that heavily about the narrative no but but i mean even playing that you 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 automatically sort of take in the idea of the war is good right um and and then of course what we talked about earlier this that's really 
regenerated the interesting idea of uh, what this meant culturally and economically for Javan to produce such a game. Right. Um, all those things kind of met up for this to be a popular game everywhere. Right. Everywhere, it's, right, yeah, it exactly. Was, it's fun, it's easy to consume and understand. Um, you're able to traipse through the levels at least to right. a decent degree to not totally waste your money. Right. It was um, um, uh, sort of, so, uh, not repetitive, but uh, reminiscent of, of other sort of game structures, as, mm -hmm. as many were. No, and I, could, yeah, and I, I mean, as a game, right? I mean, I think this one, well, we haven't talked about the sound in this game. Oh my God, it's awful. It's terrible. <laughs> um, I usually mute it. <laughs> right, but um, but other than that, um, but as a game, it, I mean, this was their, one of Capcom's breakout hits and it led to a series of games like this, right? And I think it was cloned by others. And I, this is maybe a chicken and an egg question, right, about right is this a galaga clone or is this or and is it kind of iterative is it or is it it's iterative something... but i don't think it's completely iterative right i think it's pulling things from its scroll scrollers right and the it, galaga loopers you get a little right. bit more freedom with this one um yeah right and so so i mean it, as a game it's going to bring it, it it's going to inspire other games in this same genre too so it's 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 relevant in terms of a, a game's history understanding of the development of games yeah technology Technolo yeah and how games developed and changed over time independent of sort of cultural uh ideas blended into the game right and we talk about this too right you can do technology you can do culture you can do social you can look at these games in many different ways mm -hmm. uh, we try to blend them together to some degree but you can even hear from our discussion that sometimes these uh, get separated in the way we're thinking about these right. games and um yeah there's an important history there too in terms of how it fed into similar or other games that could build off of this. I mean, even 1943 right. builds off builds this, off I think, of in a better way. It feels more fluid. It feels yeah. more engaged. It has more to it. And it's still a top-down scroller, but it's got many more elements to it. Time Pilot. Time Pilot. Um, Xevious. Xevious. Correct. Yeah. Um, really fun, creative games, but on a slightly different model. Right. Um, but coming on the same kind of mechanics and yeah. same kind of game design um around it um yeah yeah and then going back to the his, kind of cultural history of this the other thing that i think this um you were you were suggesting i think if i was kind of paying attention um right that this allows a kind of cathartic moment maybe for the japanese player um while at the same time, right, especially if, right, especially when we think about maybe 1943 um, and the Yamamoto as that boss level. Um, That's how I was, I, I thought about it. Right. I thought about it before, but then I was thinking more of it now that maybe it could be seen as that because that right. term, and I don't know a lot about this, but that term and idea is of a place in Japan. Uh, so it references more than the battleship. Right. right for Japanese, as I understand it, I could be off on this. Right. Um, but even that being said, the Yamamoto is kind of a suicide battleship. Could be sort of a cathartic thing potentially, mm. right? To demonstrate if there's loss, but there's also defiance, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, um, yeah. In the face of right, and I'm. Uh, yeah, an unrepentant enemy, which then... And that's a question right, still. Right, oh, it's a big question. And, and then we yeah. flip that, right? And so it, it, it can meet, in some ways, the needs of a Japanese consumer, but it also, at the same time, reflects the kind of, well, we won, yay, America, um, attitude yeah. that the American player can have, right? Um, and... Um, I think that's I think it's an interesting place to consider, right? That kind of universal appeal 
mm. of games yeah. like this, f- despite the fact that they're that appeal comes from two different places, both culturally and from the experience of the war, right? Yeah, I think so. And see, I think this proves a good point about these talks is <laughs> <laughs> we, we come to some idea often towards the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, um, it's like all yeah. my best classes, um, yeah. right? Where it you're developing an argument and then you're like, over the I course of I need to write this di- Excuse me while I write this down, <laughs> that, students. <exactly. laughs> um. uh, <laughs> whether we're right or not, it here is not the point either. It's, no. It's, uh, but it brings up some interesting questions. And it definitely gives us, and I think another reason why we do this series, gives us a jumping off point for other games mm-hmm. we'll be looking at. Um, which the next game... Um, what is the next I game? I think we'll be looking at <laughs> oh, is, is Gunsmoke. Is Gunsmoke. Yes. Um, a completely which, different game complete, style. Um, and we'll get out of... Well, are we going to get out of war? Yeah, I about to say, are we going to get out of war? Um, <laughs> well, that's, that's a, a good question. I think it really brings up some interesting ideas about uh, the view of the West, the West and the view of the West in Japan, right? right. As a sort of... A consumption of American culture, culture going right. the other way, right? Here Not we, only consuming it, but then, right, essentially rewriting it. Yeah, right. That might um, have to be a two-hour episode. There's gonna <laughs> uh, <there's> so much. <laughs> Sean to and talk I are about. more well versed in that. <laughs> yeah, that's our. That, yeah, that I mean, era. in some ways, um, what this game, uh, 1942, did for us was it elicited a lot of questions and kind of for me while i was thinking about this before coming on to talk about it um this is a place where it might be fun to invite somebody on who could speak to some of these issues in a in a in a more well-informed or well-researched um way um and it it it, i think it points to the important interdisciplinary um uh approach to game studies and to the importance of these as objects of study, right? That, that people can, or, or that historians who have dismissed these for a very long time, and um, I, I'm not saying anything new there, um, but there, I think part of what we're trying to do, especially with our own, even with some of our own colleagues, is to introduce them to how these things and, and bringing somebody in and talking to them, I'm rambling again, um, and talking about them with our, our colleagues um, or trying to start a dialogue like this um, with the internet, um, I think is a, is a really important approach. And there are going to be games in this series that speak to aspects of American history or to other nations' histories um, that we aren't um, Right, that that aren't part of our expertise, um, but with Gunsmoke, I think we both fit right in um, to. We're, that. we're promising a lot. But <laughs> we are, but we may be over promising. We'll have a lot to but say. We we'll have a lot to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, that was a long way to say that. You know, um, some of these games, right? Just uh, they're interesting in the way that we can ask questions of them the others will be a, a much more analytical kind of conversation about what they bring to the table. Yeah. 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 Besides looking at it technologically, but, right. but, but yeah. culturally, right. yes. And, and historically, yeah. um, how the themes and or tropes, uh, why they're there and right. how they're used and imbued in the game. Right. Yeah. Um, from two cultural perspectives, which is which is always going to be interesting, right? Um, yeah. You can have this conversation about something, um, you know, like Red Dead um, Two, um, where it's really just located in kind of an American culture, um, produced, right? Produced yeah. and yeah. consumed. Written, I mean, yeah. written yeah. for a worldwide audience, obviously, but, but um, still, it's right. It's it is an Ameri- piece of American popular culture um, with something like these games that were being 
written and programmed um, in Japan and then re-export it, right, and brought back into the United States, you get this kind of interesting, I think, uh, loop, cultural loop that happens there um, that offers quite a bit of place to kind of to jump off from or talk about, you know, a lot like this game. So. So. Yeah, so we'd, we'd like to thank anybody who, who watches this. We <laughs> will be posting this on our, our, our website, criticalplay.org. And on YouTube. And, and, I don't, and YouTube. We, and so, we don't have enough views yet to have criticalplay.org, so you just have to search for us in YouTube and you'll find us. <laughs> and leave any comments that are uh, rational, instructive, or <laughs> insightful. Um, <laughs> Sure. <laughs> for, uh, for a reasonable dialogue. <laughs> yes. Uh, no trolls allowed. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So until next time. Uh, we'll see ya. This is Jeff Waller and Sean Smith Bye. signing out from criticalplay.org. <laughs> All right.